So greetings, everybody. Good evening, good morning, good day. Um, it's wonderful to have so many people engaged today and uh, really an honor to be able to tell you about some of the research we've been doing at UBC for the last few years. So thanks, Joanna and others for, for inviting me. This is a really special opportunity. So today I'm going to tell you about work we've been doing on new photonic materials from cellulose nanocrystals. And my story starts with something very boring that I think we're all familiar with, paper. So probably all of you have had contact with paper sometime today or recently, but I doubt very many have looked at paper under an electron microscope. If you do, it has this woven fiber structure that's made of a material called cellulose. So cellulose is the most abundant biopolymer on Earth, and it is simply these glucose molecules that are linked into long polymer chains. Then these polymer chains subsequently hydrogen bond to form crystalline domains of cellulose and that are surrounded by amorphous regions of cellulose. So in a piece of regular piece of paper, there's crystalline domains and amorphous or gummy regions. But it was shown in the 1950s that if you take a piece of paper and treat it with sulfuric acid under the right conditions, you can selectively remove the amorphous regions of cellulose and isolate nanocrystals of cellulose. So these cellulose nanocrystals are pretty small, a couple hundred nanometers long, maybe five or 10 nanometers in diameter. And importantly, this process gives them these surface sulfate ester groups that allow them to have a surface charge and form stable colloids in water. So here's a blow up of that electron microscope image of cellulose nanocrystals. And just to give you some perspective, these are about 200 nanometers long you'd have to put a thousand of them end to end to be the width of a single human hair. So these are a true nanomaterial that we're talking about today. Cellulose nanocrystals are very rigid. And for that reason, they've been incorporated into a lot of different things like implant materials, um, paints and coatings, adhesives, composite materials where they reinforce polymers, for example, and even food additives and chiral catalysts. But my interest in cellulose nanocrystals arises from a very special property that they have. Shown on the left is a dilute beaker full of cellulose nanocrystals in water. And not surprising, it's a colorless solution. But if you pour this solution onto a surface and let the water evaporate, you get a colored iridescent film shown on the right. There's no dye, no pigment present, but instead this is a beautiful example of structural color. The structural color is found in many examples in nature, ranging from fish scales and bird feathers to some berries and shells that get their coloration, not from absorption due to pigments, but rather from structural order at the nanoscale that leads to interference of the light that is impinging on them. Maybe the most famous example of structural coloration from nature is the morpho butterfly. It has these beautiful blue iridescent wings. Um, actually, if you hold this butterfly up to a bright light, there's no blue pigment in them. It, it instead looks pale brown in color. The blue color comes from the fact that there's chitin features on the surface of the wing that are spaced by about four to 500 nanometers. And that leads them to selectively diffract blue light. That is, the blue light undergoes constructive interference and is selectively diffracted from the surface. So coming back to the cellulose nanocrystals, we start with a colorless solution of cellulose nanocrystals. And after drying the water, we get a colored iridescent film. And the reason for this color is that they spontaneously organize into what's called a chiral pneumatic structure. And let me illustrate for you what a chiral pneumatic structure corresponds to. So shown on the right side is an illustration of this organization. Imagine a layer of cellulose nanocrystals that are aligned in one direction. The next layer is also aligned, but the orientation of the cellulose nanocrystals is slightly rotated. The next layer is also aligned, but rotated further. And so what you build up is a structure where you have cellulose nanocrystals aligned in layers whose orientation rotates through the film. And on the far right is an illustration of the average orientation in these layers. And so when the pitch of this helical structure matches the wavelength of light, that light gets selectively diffracted and that leads to the color that you see. So that color is what we call iridescence. 
So by changing the helical pitch, it's possible to change the color that is emerging from the film. So in fact, the origin of the color is simply an extension of Bragg's law. Many of you will be familiar with Bragg's law for X-ray diffraction from crystalline materials. Um, and in this case, the D spacing corresponds to the helical pitch. And when that helical pitch matches the wavelength of light, then you get selective diffraction of that light. And because the D spacing is hundreds of nanometers, the wavelengths of light that are diffracted are in the visible range. So before I continue on to what we have done, let me just figure out how to close this up. I don't know how to, uh, if it's okay. Before I tell you what we've done, I just want to emphasize that we are not working in a vacuum. There are a lot of people around the world doing really beautiful work with the structural coloration from cellulose nanocrystals. And I show just a few examples from Eugenia Kumacheva, Professor Zhao, and Professor Vignolini. Um, and there's also many other leading researchers, including researchers at UBC like Emily and Orlando, um, and also others from across the country and the globe. So our story begins with the idea, we wondered, could we capture the chiral pneumatic organization of cellulose nanocrystals in a solid state material like glass? And it turns out that other people tried to do this, including Stephen Mann and Marcus Antonetti, um, but weren't able to transfer the chirality or the helical structure to the silica. So in our lab, we only know one chemical reaction and that's the Sol gel reaction. So this molecule, tetramethoxysilane, in water undergoes hydrolysis and condensation to give SiO2, which is just silica or glass or sand. So the silica that you form at room temperature using this preparation is an amorphous network of tetrahedral silicon atoms bridged by oxygens. So here's our chemistry. We take our beaker of cellulose nanocrystals in water and we add tetramethoxysilane and then we stir it and we transfer it into a Petri dish. So this is a Petri dish with cellulose nanocrystals, tetramethoxysilane and water. And then we just let the water evaporate overnight in the Petri dish. This is a video of the water evaporating. And you can see the color magically appear as the cellulose nanocrystals organize into this helical structure. So that tells us that the chiral pneumatic structure is forming by the cellulose nanocrystals. But at the same time, that molecule tetramethoxysilane is condensing around the cellulose nanocrystals to give silica. So what we have here is a film of about half cellulose nanocrystals and half silica. By changing the ratio of the cellulose to the silica, we can change the wavelength of light that's reflected from the films. So here are absorption spectra for four different films that we prepared. And the fact that these each show different reflection wavelength means that they have a different helical pitch in their structure. So importantly, again, we can tune the pitch of these composites to change the color reflected from them. So now we have a mixture of cellulose, nanocrystals, and silica in the composite. The next step is to burn it. We cook it at 600 degrees and that destroys all the organics, all the cellulose, and leaves us with pure silica, pure glass. So the material I'm going to tell you about now is just the glass that remains after removing the cellulose template. We look at the glass by gas absorption measurements and what we find is that they have a pretty high surface area, around 650 meters squared per gram, and the pores are around four to five nanometers in diameter, which is pretty similar to the width of the cellulose nanocrystals that we use as the template. Now this material is pure silica, which of course is colorless. That's why we make all of our windows out of silica. But our materials are colored and we can make them green, blue, yellow, or red. We can make them colorless, but reflecting infrared light or colorless and reflecting UV light. Um, just by changing the conditions that we use to prepare these materials, we can tune them by almost 2000 nanometers. If you look at the glass from the top, it looks yellow. This is the yellow piece. And you tilt the viewing angle, you'll see that it turns blue. 
So there's a strong angle dependence from Bragg's law on the coloration that you see from these films. We look at these materials by UV-Vis spectroscopy, and you can see a very intense reflection band at the wavelength corresponding to the color of light that you see from the film. So there's the blue film, green, the yellow, and the uh, red film. We use another technique that's called circular dichroism spectroscopy. So in a circular dichroism spectrometer, you measure the difference in absorption or reflection of left-handed circularly polarized light and right-handed circularly polarized light. So if you have a substance that is not chiral, you will see no signal. But the fact that we see peaks with positive ellipticity and very high intensity tells us that in all these materials, we have a left-handed helical structure. And that's consistent with the left-handed helical structure formed by the chiral pneumatic cellulose nanocrystals. We do a lot of electron microscopy to study these materials. And if you take a film of the material and you cut it and look at the cross section, you can see a pretty well-ordered layered structure. The top of the film is quite smooth and the edges always have these undulations. And if you zoom into the edges and look at them closer, then you can actually resolve a left-handed helical twist to our glass. So what we've been able to do is we've been able to produce a piece of glass that has holes arranged in a chiral pneumatic structure. That is, we start with a mixture of silica or glass and the cellulose nanocrystals in the chiral pneumatic structure. And then, then we remove the cellulose to give us a piece of glass that has holes arranged in the same structure. And so it's the arrangement of the holes in this material that gives rise to the coloration that you can see. Now, one really neat aspect of this, I mentioned the circular dichroism spectroscopy, is that these films only reflect left-handed circularly polarized light. And so I wanna demonstrate this to you with a practical example. If you go to a movie theater that shows a 3D movie, the way that it works is they project two beams of light onto the screen, one that is left-handed circularly polarized light and one that is right-handed circularly polarized light. And then these lenses in, on the glasses you wear are filters for left and right-handed circularly polarized light. So I wanna show you what our films look like if you look at them with 3D glasses. So here's a piece of chiral-nomatic mesopore silica viewed under one lens and the other. And so just as the circular dichroism spectroscopy showed us that the light reflected is left-handed circularly polarized, this also further demonstrates that all the light coming from these materials is left-handed circularly polarized. So there might be some interesting possibilities for security documents or security developments um, using this uh, feature. So we, we have over the last um, five to 10 years developed a whole family of materials using this concept. So we can use templating with cellulose nanocrystals to make plastics whose color varies because they have different pitches of the chiral pneumatic structure inside of their interior and we can pattern them. We can make hydrogels that have chiral pneumatic cellulose nanocrystals and they change color when they swell because that changes the helical pitch. We can make organosilicas, titanium dioxide and other solid state materials that again are iridescent when viewed for a, through a left-handed circularly polarized filter, but not through a right-handed circularly polarized filter. We've been able to extend this to titanium carbide, carbon, germania, magnetic ferrites, and, and a variety of other uh, metallic and semiconducting materials. Some of the possible applications we're thinking about for the chiral pneumatic mesopore silica include chiral separation, uh, reflectors and polarizers for different wavelengths of light, um, sensors. We, these uh, materials are very sensitive to guest binding, which changes the refractive index and changes the color that they reflect. We've been looking at them as templates for other materials, catalyst supports, and decorative applications, like enhancing the color of paints and ornaments. Now, there's a really cool connection with nature. So I mentioned some examples from nature of structural color. 
And another one is the jewel beetle. It has these beautiful iridescent wings. And this shell gets its color because the beetle has a chiral pneumatic organization of chitin nanocrystals on the surface of that shell. And it's, it has exactly the same optical properties as our cellulose nanocrystals and the glasses that we produce. Okay, well, you, one of our interested, one of the applications that we are interested in is optical materials because these silicas and other materials we make have pretty interesting optical properties. But one of the big problems with them is that they are full of defects. And this arises because of the liquid crystal templating approach that we use to prepare them. So shown here is a hydrogel. You can see this fingerprint defect inside of it. And this is a pretty typical um, point defect. And we want to get a better understanding of the process under which cellulose nanocrystals forms this liquid crystal template in order to better understand how we could improve the quality of the films that we make. So shown here is a homogenized cellulose nanocrystal dispersion, and I think this is about four weight percent. If you take a droplet of this and you put it on a glass slide, and then if you look at it through between crossed polarizers, then what you will see are these little droplets with these lines. And these are what are called tactoids. So you can see tactoids of different sizes, and most of them are roughly spherical, but some of them are also ellipsoidal in shape. Now, if you leave a vial of cellulose nanocrystals in water and let it stand, it will undergo phase separation so that on top is a mixture of just isotropic solution with tactoids, and the bottom is a continuous liquid crystal. And so this happens spontaneously from uh, solutions that are above about three weight percent of cellulose nanocrystals. So here's just another image of the cellulose nanocrystal tactoids in water. So when we started this work, I had never heard of tactoids. And I went to the, the internet, Google search tactoids and found the Wikipedia entry. And let me just give you a quick primer on tactoids because many of you might not be familiar with them. Um, tactoids are liquid crystalline micro domains that form in isotropic phases. And they can be spherical or spindle shaped and they are birefringent when viewed under uh, between cross polarizers. And importantly, tactoids are a transition state between the isotropic phase and the macroscopic liquid crystalline phase. But really there had been no studies of tactoids that we were aware of other than polarized optical microscopy when we started this work. And we thought we need to get a better understanding of how these tactoids behave to improve the quality of our materials. What we decided to do was to capture the tactoids inside of a hydrogel so that we could image them and study them by other techniques. So what we did was we used a reaction of acrylamide with a little bit of a cross-linking agent and a photo initiator. And we mixed that in our cellulose nanocrystal solution. And then we irradiated it with UV light to cross-link the hydrogel around the cellulose nanocrystals. And here's a photograph of the hydrogel we obtained. So there's no structural color because it's still very dilute. This is about four weight percent cellulose nanocrystals. And but you can see it's a bit hazy, and that's due to particles that are scattering from the inside. Now, if you take this hydrogel and you slice it with a knife and look at it under polarized optical microscopy, then you can see these tactoids trapped inside of the hydrogel. Now, what's cool is that because these are bulk materials, we can look at them by other techniques like electron microscopy. So we could take an electron micrograph of the tactoids and we could see ones that were a half helical pitch, one helical pitch in diameter, two helical pitches, and four helical pitches in diameter. And we were able to image all different sizes and slightly different shapes using electron microscopy. We could also take cuts of them on two different angles and we were able to prove that they also had the left-handed chiral pneumatic structure inside of the tactoid. 
So this is a model of what a tactoid looks like. It has the chiral pneumatic organization of the cellulose nanocrystals, and it's organized into either a sphere or an elongated sphere. Now shown here are two videos of tactoids growing. On the left, you can see two tactoids come together and merge to form a larger tactoid. And importantly, they have to have the right registry. As long as the layers of the cellulose nanocrystals are aligned in the correct orientation, then they can merge together to form an elongated tactoid. On the other hand, on the right-hand side, oh, it stopped. Uh, the video on the right stopped here. On the right-hand side was shown a video that there were two tactoids that came together with the wrong orientation, and that leads to a new tactoid that has a defect incorporated. So here's a model of, of what the tactoid coalescence looks like. When you have the correct registry, you can get an elongated tactoid, but if you've got the wrong registry, then you'll get a defect incorporated into the tactoid. And we can view this by electron microscopy. So in the hydrogel, we can see a collision between two tactoids here, where they have almost the right orientation. And here is a case where a tactoid has merged with a larger tactoid to form a new tactoid, but with a defect incorporated into it. So if you look at the, under polarized optical microscope, you can see the tactoids merging to the bottom under gravity to form the continuous liquid crystalline phase. And here's an electron micrograph image showing the large tactoids merging into the continuous liquid crystalline phase. And the problem is that anytime there's a defect in these tactoids, they get incorporated into the continuous liquid crystalline phase and trapped inside of the liquid crystal. So here's our model. We have different sized tactoids in solution. And as they dry, they sediment to form a continuous liquid crystal on the bottom. They undergo merging to form elongated tactoids and defect tactoids, which get incorporated into the structure on the bottom. And so we thought if we can remove the defects in the tactoids, then we can prevent the defects from forming in the liquid crystal and that would give us better materials. So the usual model for cellulose and na nanocrystal self-assembly is that you have them in an isotropic solution, you let them stand and they phase separate, and then they form a gel, and then they form a film. But we want to add an extra layer to this. And we want to allow them at this stage to have more time to anneal the tactoids so you could remove those defects before they organize in the gel and form better organized films. And so key to this would be letting them stand at a certain point when there's lots of tactoids in solution before letting them dry to get a film. And so this works really well. And shown here are two um, different samples we made. On the left is the one that I call quick evaporation, which is just normal evaporation in, at room temperature. And when you evaporate at room temperature, you get this red film and under polarized optical microscope, you can see a lot of domains. And by scanning electron microscopy of a cross section of the film, we can see a lot of defects. For comparison, if we do a slower evaporation, then we get large, much larger domains inside of the structure. And the cross section of the film is much better organized. So by leaving the sample to evaporate slower at a certain point, it, and it's critical that the tactoids are there, then we can get much better organized in, organization in the films. So here's some characterization of these films. The one that's prepared over about one day is red. And that's the one that you saw that's not that well organized. And for comparison, one that we prepared over two weeks is much better ordered and it is green. These are the circular dichroism spectra of these two films. So I still find it amazing that just by changing the evaporation time, you get quite dramatically different colors from the films of cellulose nanocrystals.
it gives them time to reach a thermodynamic minimum. Now, we had kind of a silly idea. Knowing that the evaporation rate changes the color that you get for the film, could we use this for patterning? And I asked my student, Andy, who was working on this, just a real, to do a really simple, dumb experiment. If we took a Petri dish of cellulose nanocrystals and we put a hole in the top of the lid, would it be possible that the water evaporates a little faster from the center and we actually get a different color in the center than we do on the edges? So we thought maybe we'd get a red film in the center and more of a green film towards the outside. And it works. It works super well. So when you dry the film, you get a, a sample now that is patterned radially. So the center of it's red. And as you go farther out, it gets more green in color because it, it effectively evaporates slower. We did a lot of control experiments to prove that the evaporation rate was at least part of the explanation for this. So here's an analysis of the films, um, a control sample that's grown in a petri dish without any hole is pretty homogeneous across the film. And you can see the spectra of these four different regions. Um, on the other hand, the one that was done with a hole in the center is red reflecting around 600 nanometers at the center. And as you go farther out, it shifts all the way to 400 nanometers around the edge. So extending this idea, we asked ourselves, could we apply a mask to the solution of cellulose nanocrystals, like just something floating on the surface? And could that possibly change the rate of evaporation underneath the, the mask to give a different color? And this works. So when we apply the mask at a certain point of time, this is just a piece of, piece of plastic that we applied, then underneath that region, it evaporates slower and gives us a different color than the rest of the film. And depending on when you place the mask, you can tune the optical properties that you observe in the final film. So shown here, the U was placed on early, the B was placed on at a medium point, and the C was placed on close to the end of the process. And so we get different colors for those four different letters or three different letters. And if you look at the scanning electron micrograph at the intersection where the B has been placed, then you can actually see that there's a different helical pitch to the cellulose nanocrystals inside the B where it's green and outside of the B where it's red. All right, let me just have a quick drink before we um, continue to the last section. I wanna shift gears a little bit and tell you about some really cool materials we've been trying to work on for the last couple of years. <clears throat> One of our goals for a long time was to make elastomeric materials. So elastic materials with cellulose nanocrystals in a helical structure so that when you stretch them or compress them, they could change color. And these could be useful for pressure sensing or measuring force, for example. But we worked on this for a long time before we were able to have any success. And the technical barrier is that Cellulose nanocrystals are hydrophilic. So they are normally in water. Um, it's possible to put them into some other polar solvents, but they don't, they don't usually behave the same way when they're put into other solvents. On the other hand, elastomers and their monomers are generally hydrophobic. So we tried a lot of experiments where we would mix cellulose nanocrystals with different elastomers, and we always got phase separation. But I had a really brilliant uh, visiting scientist from Japan in my lab for a couple of years. And I'm gonna walk you through the process that he developed that allowed us to make uh, elastomeric cellulose nanocrystal composites. So the first step is that you have to add glucose or some other agent to the cellulose nanocrystal suspension. This is a critical component because it acts as a plasticizer. Then you just let it uh, undergo evaporation induced self-assembly, which is a fancy term for drying. And that gives you a glucose cellulose nanocrystal film. So shown here, 
is the glucocellulose nanocrystal film that we produce, which is colored and iridescent. Um, it's, and we can, we can tune the wavelength of light that it's reflecting. So the next step is that we take this colored iridescent film and we swell it in DMSO solvent. So you take dimethyl sulfoxide, swell this film, and that gives you now a colored, or sorry, colorless film, because now the helical pitch is out of the wavelength of visible light. So then in the next step, we take that, this film and we infiltrate it with monomers. In this case, the monomers we chose are 2-hydroxyethylacrylate and ethyl ethylacrylate, which we optimized to give us uh, good properties in the final materials. And we add a photo initiator, or actually, sorry, in this case, a thermal initiator, AIBN. And then we heat the film up and initiate polymerization. So shown here is a photograph of the elastomer that we produce. And this has cellulose nanocrystals embedded in a chiral pneumatic structure. Um, shown here is a cross section of the film by scanning an electron microscopy. And you can see this pretty well ordered layered structure that we've come to see over and over in our uh, chiral pneumatic materials. So this material is very flexible. Shown here is the relaxed sample. It's colorless and transparent. And the helical axis is coming out of the screen towards you. And you can stretch this material about eight or nine times its original length, and it will go back to its original form. So it's a very elastomeric material. Now, it doesn't show any structural color when you stretch it. But if you stretch it between parallel polarizers, then you can see quite a dramatic change in its birefringence. So initially, it's almost colorless. But as we stretch it between parallel polarizers, you can see the color change. And when we first saw this, we thought the color was coming from the fact that the cellulose nanocrystals must be aligning inside of the material to give such a high um, change in birefringence. And so to probe that, we were fortunate to know that cellulose nanocrystals are crystalline. They diffract x-rays. So they, the cellulose nanocrystals have a large diffraction around 22 degrees to theta. And we can use that to probe the orientation of the cellulose nanocrystals in the film. So what we did was two-dimensional x-ray diffraction. And if you take a film of chiral pneumatic cellulose nanocrystals alone, and you look at it by x-ray diffraction parallel to the helical axis, then it samples cellulose nanocrystals in all orientations through the film. And consequently, there's no angle dependence on the x-ray diffraction. And if you do this, if you look at the relaxed um, cellulose nanocrystal elastomer composite, same thing, we don't see any angle dependence on the diffraction. But when you stretch the film perpendicular to the helical axis and you look at it, then you see a very strong angle dependence emerge when the cellulose nanocrystals are um, aligned. So this tells us that the cellulose nanocrystals are initially in a chiral pneumatic structure, but when we stretch the elastomer, they become aligned parallel to the stretching axis. So we were able to measure the Hermann's order parameter and the birefringence change as a function of elongation and prove that the cellulose nanocrystals are becoming aligned as we stretch the material. So initially we have the chiral pneumatic organization with the helical axis perpendicular to the film. Then as you stretch it, the cellulose nanocrystals are kind of unwinding to give you the alignment that you see here. In fact, now we know that they're not all unwinding, but probably only at the ends of the stacks or the edges of the film. So what we've been able to do is make flexible birefringent materials. We have ordered cellulose nanocrystals in, in rubber. Um, they have reversible optical properties. They unwind and rewind their spiral organization, but we can only view this change through 
um, pol uh, either parallel or cross polarizers. So how can we get real color that you could see with your naked eye? I had another brilliant postdoc, Charlotte, who worked with a great graduate student in my group, Andy, and they worked to optimize the conditions that we use to make these elastomeric materials. And they found that by optimizing SOAK1, and, which was the swelling with the DMSO, and SOAK2, which is the swelling with the monomer, that they could drive the chiral pneumatic structure to be close to the wavelengths of visible light. So this is a sample that Charlotte is holding of chiral pneumatic um, cellulose nanocrystals embedded in an elastomer. And you can see initially it's colorless and transparent, but when she stretches it, you'll see the color appear. And that's because she's stretching it perpendicular to the helical axis. And as she stretches it, the helical axis shrinks so that it goes from reflecting infrared light, which is colorless, to visible light. So we can stop this at different stretching points. Here it is initially relaxed, it's colorless, it's reflecting infrared light. And as you stretch it, it goes to red, to green, to blue, and then you can stretch it farther so that it's reflecting UV light. We characterize these by reflectance UV vis spectroscopy, and you can see the reflectance of uh, the sample at different stretching extents. And we can also see by circular dichroism spectroscopy that all the light reflected from these is left handed circularly polarized, just telling us that it's still the same chiral pneumatic structure of cellulose nanocrystals. Now, something that we can do is we can pattern our glucose cellulose nanocrystal film using the method I showed you before. We can change the evaporation rate of the cellulose nanocrystal glucose suspension in different regions to form a film. So here's a film, for example, that we've produced that's red on the right and green on the left because we slow down the evaporation on the left-hand side of it. So what we did was we patterned the glucose um, the glucose cellulose nanocrystal films initially using two methods, the evaporation rate on the bottom where we could make a gradient film with red and green. And we also pattern them using droplets of water. So that changes the wavelength of light from underneath the droplets of water. And we converted both of these samples all the way into our elastomer. And these are shown here, they're colorless and transparent. They're both reflecting infrared light. But now if you stretch them, You can see on the top one, we get red spots where we had the droplets of water for the patterning on a blue background. And on the bottom one, we get a, a uh, colored pattern that emerges with the gradient perpendicular to the helical or to the stretching axis. And we can control the position and orientation of the gradient that we get by changing the way that we stretch the material. So we're looking now at being able to incorporate text and graphics into these stretchable elastomers. It would only be apparent when you stretch the material or when you press it. They also show these same colors when you press them. They're just harder to characterize. Now the final three minutes, I wanna just tell you about some really recent work that was just accepted for publication this week. And these are shape memory polymers. So just as a quick introduction to shape memory polymers, Polymers for shape memory processes have physical crosslinks and um, covalent crosslinks. So these black spots are the covalent crosslinks, and they have some also physical crosslinks that allow them to remember their shape. So to use a shape memory polymer, what you do is you take this crosslink polymer and you heat it above the glass transition temperature, and then you can stretch it or twist it or press it somehow deform it. And then if you cool it while it's still under the stress, you can capture that structure. And when you remove the stress and cool it, you get the sample retaining this new shape. But now if you heat the sample above the glass transition temperature, it will recover its original shape 
because it has this memory due to the covalent and physical crosslinks. So what we wanted to do was to embed cellulose nanocrystals in a shape memory polymer in order to make variable and recyclable photonic structures. And uh, we're, not, we're not the first ones to make photonic structures with shape memory polymers. And I'll just give one reference at the bottom, uh, Fang and coworkers, uh, Nature Communications paper from 2015 reported it with spherical particles. So in order to do this, what we did was we take cellulose nanocrystals in suspension with our glucose, form that film and swell it with our monomer. But the monomers that we use include a covalent crosslinker um, shown here, and also one with physical crosslinks due to hydrogen bonding. And so our crosslink polymer that we get after heating it around the cellulose nanocrystals has both covalent um, crosslinks and these physical crosslinks that arise from the hydrogen bonding of these, of these organic groups here. So shown here is a sample that we made. Um, this is about a centimeter across of this shape memory polymer with cellulose nanocrystals embedded. And if you heat this up and you press it at, in this case, 140 newtons and cool it down, then you get a red photonic film. So what we've done is we've compressed the helical pitch so that it's reflecting red light and it will stay like this indefinitely. But then you can heat it back up and it goes to the original colorless sample. You can heat it and press it to a, a greater extent to form a green film or a blue film. And so in fact, these samples shown here, the four photographs are the same sample recycled with different pressures. We characterize these again by UV vis spectroscopy and we can see that they reflect different wavelengths which we can tune across the spectrum. And we also measure them by circular dichroism spectroscopy and see that they are reflecting circularly polarized light from their surface. Now, one good question is how recyclable are these? And what we did was we did a series of 15 cycles with a sample. We start with this sample shown here, which is colorless and transparent. We pressed it until it gave us a green film. And then we, after, I think after one hour, we heated it above the glass transition temperature to get this colorless film. Then we pressed it again, leave it for a while, heat it above the glass transition temperature, and we did this cycling 15 times and showed that there was almost no variation in the color through this process. So I want to show you that we can also imprint photonic patterns in the materials. So this is an unpressed sample. And by heating it above the glass transition temperature with a press that has a, a nickel, a Canadian coin, um, with raised features, we can embed those inside of the structure. And then when you heat this above the glass transition temperature, it goes back to the colorless film shown at the bottom. So I'm going to show you a video of taking this photonic film, which is shown here. So this is the iridescent photonic shape memory polymer. And I'm going to show you what happens when you, oh, maybe it's not going to work. Oh, there it goes. So you take this film, and we've decided we don't want that pattern anymore. So let's heat it above the glass transition temperature. And we lose all sign of the pattern. And then you can take this and you can press a different pattern into it. So we have a recyclable photonic polymer system. All right, well, that brings me to the end of my talk. And I, just to recap, then we've developed a new family of mesoporous materials that have tunable chiral-nomadic structures. We've been exploring the properties and structures of tactoids as a way to understand our materials growth and better um, optimize the structure of the films that we produce. We've been making flexible photonic materials, shape memory photonic materials, um, and elastomers that change color when you stretch them, all using cellulose nanocrystals from the forest. 
And I think some of these are promising materials for making new sensors, displays, decoration, and security. And most important, we have fun doing this work. So I need to thank the people who did this work. I have an amazing group of coworkers. Um, I, maybe some of them are here today, I, I'm not sure. Um, this is a, I have to give credit to Miguel Soto, Charlotte Boat, and Andy Tran, who did some of the recent work that I talked about today. I want to thank Wadud, my collaborator at FP Innovations. And I want to thank these organizations who funded various parts of our work. And so finally, thank you so much for the opportunity to talk today. And I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor McLaughlin. So I believe that our, our audiences would like to take this valuable opportunities to talk with you and also uh, hear about your opinions about their uh, questions. Uh, sure. oh, actually, I also noticed that uh, like our friend, Dr. Uh, Orlando Rajas, who is also the <laughs> Byproducts Institute, uh, the chair of the Byproducts Institute in UBC, and also the honorary chair of the Asia Pacific Young Scientists Asso Asso Association, is also with us today. So thank you very much, Orlando, for joining us. And uh, uh, everyone, if you have any questions, please feel free to open your video and uh, uh, unmute yourself to uh ask uh, dr mclachlan I, I i believe dr mclachlan will be very happy to answer it so oh so dr chen prophet chen yeah i i, I saw you open <laughs> your <video. laughs> you are on mute Uh, you are on mute. Sorry, we couldn't hear you. Maybe you didn't open your Mac. Sorry. Oh. Prof Chen. Prof Chen, we couldn't hear you. Please unmute yourself. Still, still couldn't hear you. Still can't hear. Maybe, maybe in maybe you can put a question ah, in the chat. Oh, oh there you go. It, yeah. it works now. <coughs> hi, Mark. Hi, Wenchui. Hi, hi, Mark. This is Wenchui Chen. Yeah. So thanks a lot for your nice presentation. As we emailed with each other several days ago, you you really did an excellent uh, research work and for leading this. Uh, hot and important uh, research area. Actually, we, we have many inspira uh, inspirations from your uh, high quality, many high quality papers. Uh, actually, I have many questions, but at present, I, I have two. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the first one, uh, <clears throat> you, you have do many uh, beautiful, colorful films using the cellulose uh, nanocrystals. I think that so uh, uh, the, uh, the solid concentration of the precursors actually is quite important. So my first question is how to prepare the, uh, the, the um, precursors. For example, if we have uh, cellulose nanocrystal suspensions with solid content of uh, around 5%, it's quite easy to prepare, to add some water and to make it at around 3.5%. However, actually it's difficult to produce the solid, the precursors with solid content larger than, in my opinion, I think larger than 5% or 6%. Actually, yeah. if we have suspensions, of, for example, 1%, 1%, so how to produce the precursors to improving the concentration from 1% to 3% or 5%. That's my first question. And the second question is, actually the, the film is quite nice and with quite uh, special and intricate structures. Actually, but usually we need a long time 
uh, to produce a web film using the evaporation method, for example, more than 20 hours. So based on your experience in this area, do you think uh, you have found some efficient ways uh, to produce uh, a film with colorful structures and specific uh, uh, structures, cheronematic structures, for example, just using one minute or several seconds or several minutes. So, so can, can, can we have some, do you have, have you ever found some ways to do this uh, interesting uh, uh, idea uh, area? So thank you, Mark. Yeah, thanks so much for your, for your question. Let, let me answer them in reverse order. So the, the last question you asked is, can we increase the drying rate and still produce the colored materials? Unfortunately, we have not had much success at imp improving the drying rate. And the problem is if you heat them up, then you get a lot, like you can heat them and it'll, the water will evaporate faster, but then you get more defects and above a certain, maybe above 60 degrees, you just don't get any chiral pneumatic structure at all. So you're really limited to close to room temperature for those. And it's hard to, I, I would love to see if we could find a way to spray dry them and get the same structure, but we haven't been able to. And your, your second question, or your first question was to do with concentrating the cellulose nanocrystals. You know, uh, yes. I showed you, I showed you quite a few materials today and it, it looks really simple but it takes a long time to optimize the conditions to find the right mixture of solids that gives you structural color. Um, I think we, we have a pretty good understanding now when we make a new material, roughly what concentrations we need. And usually the cellulose nanocrystals we start with are about three or four weight percent almost every time. So if you have more dilute cellulose nanocrystals, it, it takes too long to evaporate, and usually the structure the structure is not nearly as good. And if you have higher concentrations, like five weight percent or six weight percent, then they they tend to form gels too early before they before they form the structural color. Yeah. Like so it, yes. it, yeah. So we spend a lot of time optimizing those conditions. I can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Hope to see you in Harbin in the near future. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> I'd love to visit. Yeah. It's going to keep you in touch. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chen. Mm -hmm. Actually, I see some questions in the chat box. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, maybe uh, would you mind I read some of them? Sure. Yeah, the first yeah. one is from Hengzhou, I guess, from the University of Photography. Uh, mm -hmm. He said that uh, uh, and these very beautiful films are also kind of photonic crystals. According to the bright diffraction equation, the presented color would be related to instant light angle. Different light angle will have different color. So uh, he is wondering if it is possible to synthesize, uh, synthesize the angle independence film. <laughs> yeah, so absolutely correct. Because this is Bragg's law, you have a strong angle dependence on the color when you have well-ordered films. And so the trick, if you want to make more angle independent films is to have more defects, to have domains that are oriented in different directions. Um, we've done a little bit of that using surfactants. So using surfactants, we can control the domain size so they're much smaller and they end up being oriented in different directions. And we've gotten films that are show lower angle dependence, but still not, not great, especially if you go towards the red end of the spectrum, then it's really hard to get angle independence. A big limitation for for some applications. All right. So another one is from uh, uh, Zhao Lu Wang. Uh, he or she said that, dear professor, now or in the future, what are the challenges you are interested in or want to explore in the realm of cellulose nanocrystals? <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, good question. I, I think we're we're still very much interested in the flexible materials, optimizing some of their properties, especially I'm trying to we're trying to make flexible materials that will that you can just touch very lightly and get a big color change. And that that is really hard. The ones I showed you today, you have to press them pretty hard with your fingers to change the color. Um, but I, I think if we could make ones that are much more receptive, then they could be used as parts of electronics or um, displays, possibly. OK, thank you. Another one from Zhang Kang Li. He wants to know that which parameters determine the uh, uh, shade of uh, colors. For example, I something pre sometimes prepared some CNC membranes with dark red, and sometimes I prepare some CNC membranes with light red. Does it have something to do with the dimension of CNC particles? Hmm. Not, not that I'm aware of. I think, so if it's just films of cellulose nanocrystals, you're absolutely right that you can get regions that are dark and regions that are lighter in color. I, I, I don't have a good answer for that. Some of the materials we've made will see different shades because there's a combination of the reflection and some absorption of other components. Um, but I don't know for pure cellulose nanocrystals. The optical properties are, are a bit bizarre, and I don't know if there's a dependence on the dimensions of the cellulose nanocrystals that you use. Okay, thank you. So a very cute question from Kathy. Uh, she, she, she said that she's, oh, give me a second, it's jumping away. So, ah, Kathy said that thank you for your uh, wonderful presentation, Professor Mark Mac. Uh, McLaughlin, the color of your shirt is quite suitable for subject today. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, her question is the first one is our film formed from the CNC that we bought was not so colorful, nearly single color, but it looks colorful if under uh, under dot light source <clears throat> from the uh, backside. So, why it is like this. The second one is, do you think it is possible to make a composite film with CNC and other inorganic uh, non-metal materials? Thank you. So I'll answer the second part of that question first. It's certainly possible to make composites of cellulose nanocrystals with inorganic um, non-metal non materials. Um, we, we've done some of that and other people have as well. Um, making them composite materials with silica, germania, tin oxide, titanium dioxide, and, and some other materials, for example. Um, I, I don't know if I understand the question about the, the dot light source and why you see a different color with when you use that. Um, you know, one thing that we've learned is every batch of cellulose nanocrystals is different, and that is going to be a big limitation for commercial applications because you have to kind of calibrate every batch of cellulose nanocrystals. We've, we've had some batches that are just amazing, give remarkably colored materials every single time and other ones that are crummy. Every Most of the films don't have a very good color. Um, so I would just, if you're having problems with the batch that you're using, I would just get another batch. Okay, thank you. So uh, Jia Li said that thank you so much for your presentation and uh, she is wondering that uh, like what drives the formation of the twisting structure of CNC is that the charge charge repelling, uh, repelling force. Uh, do you think it's possible to alter the twist or control the orientation and the space of the twist by changing the charges of a CNC or through any other process? Yeah, the, the origin of the twist is still not fully understood. And I'll give you my perspective. So this, I mean, it is always a left-handed helical structure. People have tried many different ways to change the structure to a right-handed, and it's it's not possible so far with cellulose nanocrystals. Although there's other cellulose derivatives that form right-handed structures, even switchable ones. Um, 
So the cellulose nanocrystals, their surface is made of glucose, which is chiral. And that's the origin of the, the chiral director, I guess you'd say, to give the left-handed structure. But how the cellulose nanocrystals, um, or why they form the left-handed structure, some people think that it's the shape of the cellulose nanocrystals, that they have this helical twist to the crystal, and that leads them to pack into the uh, left-handed structure. I'm more of the opinion, and, and lots of other people are, that there is a charge distribution on the surface of the cellulose nanocrystals that is helical and responsible for communicating the helical structure. Um, and I prefer the charge repulsion argument because the cellulose nanocrystals will form the chiral pneumatic structure even when they're very far apart. And it, I, I really think it needs to be electrostatic interactions between those sulfate ester groups. So you can change the helical twisting power by changing the charge distribution on the surface. And I think probably changing the, the nature of the charges or the surface uh, groups will also affect the helical twisting power, but I, I don't really know of the studies directly that, that report that. Thank you. Uh, another question from uh, uh, Fei uh, said that uh, uh, dear Professor Mark Mac uh, Mac McLean, uh, uh, thank you very much for your wonderful presentation. Uh, do ambient, uh, ambient temperature and the humidity have any effect on evaporation uh, induced self-assembly of CNC? Absolutely. Yeah, so the temperature is critical. Um, it, 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 affects, it, it affects the rate that the water evaporates from the film, but it also affects the order of the cellulose nanocrystals. Um, and the humidity also makes a big difference. So we haven't, we haven't worked generally in a controlled humidity environment, um, but others have, and you can control the, the organization of the cellulose nanocrystals pretty carefully using controlled humidity. Okay, actually a lot of questions, but uh, here maybe I yeah, just uh, pick one, last one, or because, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I can see that. Okay, so maybe pick the last one from uh, sure. by Lin Chen. Uh, dear Mark, can you, uh, no, uh, I'm wondering, uh, is it possible to produce flexible CNC film with Charo uh, pneumatic structure using some efficient this? So I think that might be the similar to the question that uh, Professor Chen asked before. I, I'm not sure what efficient ways means, whether it's faster. <laughs> I, I think the speed of it is going to be difficult to, I, I mean, I would love to be able to make these materials in minutes, but they always take like 20 hours for the water to evaporate. Um, and if we go to, or even you can put cellulose nanocrystals into some organic solvents if you ion exchange them, but then they don't organize into the chiral pneumatic structure. So that, that ends up being a big limitation. Okay, thank you. So maybe uh, could you bear me a last question because someone uh, messaged me, I want me to ask for him or her for, the, for this one. So maybe the last one is like, uh, uh, thank you very much for your presentation, uh, Professor Mark and uh, uh, he or she wondering that, uh, um, is it possible to prevent the formation of tech toys? Hmm. So tactoids are the liquid crystalline droplets. We can prevent them from forming if we increase the ionic strength. So if you add uh, too high a concentration of sodium chloride to the solution, you can prevent the tactoids from forming. Okay. Yeah, so we, we've, we've done that as control experiments um, to disrupt the, the liquid crystal structures. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, actually, um, we have the Vancouver time 6 or 8 p.m. now already, so I don't want to keep everyone so late here. 
so uh, at last, I would like to thank Professor McLaughlin for joining us, giving this uh, like in informative and also excellent talk to everyone. Uh, and also thank you uh, all the audiences for joining us from all the Asia Pacific region. And uh, thank you very much. Have a good day from Asia side and also have a good night from Vancouver side. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks, Joanna. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Thank you. Thank you, Professor McMartin. Have a good weekend. <laughs> <laughs> See you later. See you.